Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our annual Holocaust Memorial Day ceremony. My name is Andrew Boff, and I am chair of the London Assembly. The London Assembly is a body that is the voice of London, and, it, that, and this uh, ceremony is extraordinarily important to us. Thank you, Emmanuel Bach, for that beautiful opening performance. Thank you also to the Imperial War Museum for hosting this event today, and for those participants in the ceremony, and to all of you joining us online. Holocaust Memorial Day is supported by the Holocaust Educational Trust and the Holocaust uh, Memorial Day Trust, and serves as a poignant reminder of the senseless loss of life through war, persecution, and conflict. Um, in the name of an ideology. It is an opportunity to educate current gen generations about the dangers of persecution, anti-Semitism, racism, and discrimination in all its forms. Today, we remember those murdered during the Holocaust, under Nazi uh, persecution, and in the genocides which followed in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia and Darfur. The theme of this year's Holocaust Memorial Day is one day. Now you can interpret that in so very many ways, but the more, as we, more we learn about the past and empathize with the struggles of people in the past, it emboldens us to take action for a better future so that there may be one day in the future with no genocide. And now I would like to invite the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, to give his address. Sadiq. Thank you, Andrew, for that introduction and for your thoughtful words. Andrew and I may come from different political parties but on days like today, we couldn't be more united in our views and sentiment. It's a privilege to take part in this ceremony and to be standing in solidarity with so many others who are committed to tackling anti-Semitism, hatred and prejudice. I'd like to begin by thanking everyone at the Imperial War Museum for helping us to host this event in advance of Holocaust Memorial Day on Thursday. In particular, I want to express my gratitude to Diane and James for their warm welcome and kind tour of the new Holocaust galleries. I also want to th thank the Chief Executive of the Holocaust Educational Trust Karen Pollock, CBE, and the CEO of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, Olivia Marks Waldman, OBE, for the vital work you and your organizations are doing to educate younger generations. It was a real privilege to have the opportunity a moment ago to speak with uh, John, Stephen, and Jan, who survived the Holocaust. Every time I talk with survivors and listen firsthand to their stories and testimony. It reinforces for me not only the gravity of those painful events, but the necessity of remembering them. The Holocaust was a wicked crime that shamed humanity. And like other subsequent genocides in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, and Darfur, it simply can never be allowed to fade from our collective memory. So today, we commemorate all those who lost their lives in these heinous events. At the same time, we also make a solemn pledge to remember and to learn the lessons of history. Because one of the best ways we could honor those who have perished 
is not only to keep their memory and stories alive, but to make the effort to understand how these horrors could unfold in the first place. After all, something so sickening and on such a scale as the Holocaust and the concentration camps couldn't happen overnight. These were preceded by a slow and steady drumbeat of blame and bigotry that went unchallenged and unchecked for too long. There was a process of othering that saw Jewish people cast as scapegoats, less human and the source of all society's problems. Knowing this explains why we must act fast to stamp out anti-Semitism and prejudice now, whenever and wherever they rear their ugly head. Because we can clearly see where such poisonous attitudes can lead if allowed to take root. The experience and the experiences and suffering of the Jewish people and the genocides that have followed in the years since the Second World War teach us that the consequences of indifference will always be devastating and that we must be eternally on guard and ready to challenge those who seek to sow the seeds of hatred and division, standing together against any attempts to demonize or dehumanize our minority communities and standing up for equality, unity, and the fundamental rights of every human being. Anti-Semitism has been described as history's oldest hatred. But as events in Texas less than two weeks ago sadly demonstrated, it is not a relic of the past. Rather, it is a modern day reality too for too many Jewish people that must be confronted and defeated. This year, the theme for Holocaust Memorial Day is one day. And so I'd like to finish by urging Londoners to come and spend one day at the Imperial War Museum's new galleries. Because if each of us takes one day to learn about the Holocaust and its origins, I believe we can look forward to many days where the focus of hate and prejudice are in retreat and the values of hope, peace and unity are in the ascendancy. Thank you. Thank you, Sadiq. And unusually for us two, we entirely agree. And I, I recommend most strongly the mayor's course of action uh, in this place, in this instance. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce our first speaker, uh, Karen Pollock, CBE, who's chief executive of the Holocaust Educational Trust. Thank you. And my thanks to the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, the London Assembly for hosting this important event, and to Dame Diane Lees and the Imperial War Museum for accommodating us today. During the Holocaust, despite the severe hardships they had to endure, Jewish children in ghettos, camps, in hiding, still harbored hopes and dreams after the war, a notebook belonging to a boy named Avraham Koplovitz was discovered. It contained, it contained drawings and poems. In his poem, A Dream, he said, when I grow up and reach the age of 20, I'll set out to see the enchanting world. I'll take a seat in a bird with a motor. I'll rise and soar high into space. And he went on to describe how he'd see the faraway world soaring over rivers and oceans and fly above the clouds. These were the dreams of a child, but they were cut short. Avraham was deported to Auschwitz where he was murdered, aged 14. 
1.5 million children were murdered during the Holocaust. I mention Avraham because each and every victim had a name. Each had dreams and aspirations, hopes for the future. Today, and over several years now, many of those who managed to survive against all odds share their testimony. Not only so the world will know what happened, not only to educate where the poison of hate and anti-Semitism can lead, not only in memory of their loved ones brutally killed, but for all those without a voice. Six million men, women, and children. I admire our survivors for so many reasons. What they had to endure is unimaginable, yet they relive their worst trauma so that future generations will know. They witnessed the very worst of humanity, yet they demonstrate strength, positivity, and kindness, the very best of the human spirit. And they are determined, whatever it takes, to give a voice to the voiceless. It is this courage that our next speaker has in bucket loads. Stephen Frank was born in 1935 in Amsterdam. He was a child during the Holocaust. He shares his testimony in schools across the country, and we are all eternally grateful to him. Friends, I'm proud to introduce Stephen Frank. Well, I don't have to introduce myself, that's for one thing. Um, my father, I was born in Amsterdam, in Amsterdam. My father was born in the city of Zwolle, where his father was a doctor, and he graduated uh, with a PhD in law and was working in an office in Amsterdam when he met my mother, who was born in Eastbourne, here in this country, and had been uh, gone over to Holland to study there, and they met in a park when she had a puncture and looked pretty miserable, and he mended it for her, and they looked into one another's eyes, and that's why I'm here today. Um, with the rise of Hitler in Germany, many German refugees came over uh, to Holland, hoping that they would be safe, and my father was commissioned by the Dutch government to start up a, a welfare organization to help these people find homes and work um, so that they could mingle with the, with the Dutch community. Uh, when the Germans invaded Holland, that um, funding stopped, and he had to work very hard to get Dutch Jews to help their German co-religionists um, to survive. He joined the Dutch resistance. He spent many times trying to find hiding places for Jews to hide. We even hid Jews in our own home from time to time. Jews hiding Jews, that's something you don't come across very often indeed. He also was a link in a chain that people who had false papers made for them would come to his office for legal advice, and by that time he was only allowed to give legal advice to Jews, and these papers would get them through Holland, Belgium, and across the Alps, into the safety of neutral Switzerland. And it was in one morning in October 1942 um, when he left to go to work and we never saw him again. He was betrayed, the secure security people took him away from his office. He went to the SS headquarters on the Wetering Schans in Amsterdam, from there to the notorious camp at Amersfoort where he was beaten and tortured and from then on, on to Westerbark, and after a short while there, he was, went on to Auschwitz, where he was murdered in the gas chambers on the 21st of January, 1943. So very close to our own Holocaust Memorial Day here. My mother was suddenly on her own, and she started to show some of her incredible strength and bravery. 
And on one instance, she actually met my father in the prison, having pl changed places with one of the cleaners and had gone in there disguised as a man, leaving three children behind. That must have been a remarkable feat to do something like that. Three of my father's friends petitioned the German authorities for clemency for my father. He was an up-and-coming lawyer. He was definitely destined for high places in the legal system. They um, pleaded with the German authorities. This was a very dangerous thing to do. After all, they were pleading for a Jew who was in the Dutch resistance to boot. The, Jew, the Germans wouldn't relent, but due to um, persistent uh, persistency by them, we were put on one of the um, several priority lists that the Germans had set up in Holland um, to stop mass panic among the Jewish population, promising all sorts of things which, of course, were never kept. Um, and then one day we got a letter to say we, were to, we had to leave our home, report to the station to be sent to this special camp uh, where we would be remaining for the rest of the war, which, of course, didn't happen. After six months in this back camp, it was called Bernefeld, a castle it was, that had been requisitioned. We were then transferred to Westerbark, the main big transit camp, where we really began to see what was happening. Transports would leave every, every week on a Tuesday, all organized by Adolf Eichmann, anything between 900 and 3,000 people, mostly in cattle trucks. They were clearly labeled Auschwitz, Sobibor, if you were lucky, you went to Belsenbergen or the occasional one that went to Theresienstadt. And we were there for a whole year, which is an unusual long time, with the Allies now in Arnhem. We were taken um, by train, again, cattle truck, uh, to Theresienstadt. Um, it's a journey that I shall never forget. 39 hours, no sleep, no water. But I remember most of the stench that built up in this cattle truck of human sweat, of vomit, of feces, of urine, you know that the oxygen levels within the cattle truck were dropping. And I remember when it eventually it stopped at Theresienstadt and they opened the cattle truck door, they slid it open, this great waft of ice cold air came into the cattle truck and you could breathe again. It's like diving into a swimming pool and it's coming up all in sort of slow motion. Theresienstadt was yet another transit camp and uh, we were really waiting our time to be taken to the killing fields of the East. But we were at the end of the queue, luckily for us, being on this Bernefeld list. And we were luckily, we were liberated on the uh, 9th of May, 1945, by the, by the Russian army. And the day before that, my mother, returning from the camp hospital where she volunteered to work in unbelievably dangerous um, um, conditions there, where she had hot water and she could wash her children's clothes so that we could keep typhus at bay, and also she would wash adults' clothes and barter that for food to give to her children. And on returning from that hospital on that, on that 8th of May, um, she was approached by some Russian prisoners of war who were now also in the camp, and they pleaded with her to go into their house, and in their attic, they'd hidden a radio. Would you believe it? A radio. And my mother wrote down on a piece of paper what she heard, and it was Winston Churchill broadcasting from the cabinet war rooms, which is not that far from here, and that the war would be over at midnight that night. That piece of paper is here in the Imperial War Museum. Um, my mother wanted to go to England. She feared there would be nobody left in Holland alive, um, but the Red Cross said, you can't go to England from here because the, Germ the, the um, Russians don't talk to the Brits. There's no communication. They'll have to go to Holland, go to the embassy, and then come to England, which my mother didn't want to do. We were put on the second transport to be sent to Holland, um, I went to a holding camp in a place called Falkenau on the Czech-German borders, with my mother still pleading with the Red Cross, and they then suggested there was an ambulance with some wounded French soldiers, which was going to Pilsen, and um, we could go with them to Pilsen. Pilsen was occupied by the Americans, and the Americans were talking to the Brits, and you might have a chance to be able to get through there. So we went to Pilsen, and we arrived there in a DP camp, that's a displaced, displaced person camp, a huge hangar lit with arc lights, and it was like moving into hell. I've never seen a place like it of human misery of, of the utmost I've not even witnessed in the camps. It was absolutely, absolutely terrible. And while we were there, uh, my mother um, persuaded uh, through the garrison commander of the, of the, um, the unit there, um, there were two RAF pilots of transport command who flew us 
uh, completely illegally and purely for humanitarian reasons in an empty cargo plane because they came three times a week there for food for the garrison. They flew us in this empty cargo plane to Croydon Airport, which was then the Heathrow of London, and there the plane landed on the runway and the, uh, they opened the door. Um, we got out, uh, the, 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 the props were still running, they closed the door and they taxied away. They were obviously going back, I think to Manchester, I think, to refuel and to reload for the next trip. And there we were standing on the runway of Britain's major airport and you'd think someone would come along and say, what the devil are you doing here? But nobody came. And then another aeroplane landed and a whole lot of people got out. And luckily for us, it turned out to be Brits who had been interned in Europe when war was declared, couldn't get back, and now they were coming home, and we just joined them. So I always say in a funny sort of way that I'm a bit of a, an illegal immigrant. Um, and we then got onto a coach which took us from Croydon Airport straight across London to Stanmore, where the RAF reception center was, and we went straight through and we saw the enormous amount of damage that had been done, you know, the blitz of which we knew absolutely nothing uh, at all. And there we were at the RAF reception center. My mother was being interviewed. And while we were there, something happened. And you know, the theme has been said before is one day. And this one day, this was one day, one happy day I want to tell you about. Because while we were there, like all government organizations, there's always a policeman there. This old boy had obviously been brought out of retirement to do his bit. And there he was with these three scraggly little boys and he taught us our first English, which was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then he gave us each sixpence, which is about a pound in today's money. And that was the first time that a policeman in a uniform had said anything kind to me in five years. And that is why this country is so very, very special to me and many others too. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Stephen. I've got a feeling I could carry on listening to you for a good few hours um, about your experiences. Now I would like to introduce students Gia Sumal and Lawrence Roran two ambassadors who will share their reflections on participating in the Holocaust Educational uh, Trust's Lessons from Auschwitz project. Please take the stage. Good morning. I am Lawrence Raran, and this is Gia Sumo, and we are ambassadors for the Holocaust Educational Trust. We took part in the Lessons from Auschwitz online project as pupils from Town and Grammar School in June 2021. The project involved us meeting a Holocaust survivor, experiencing what the site of Auschwitz-Birkenau looks like today through virtual reality, and commemorating and remembering the Holocaust by sharing what we learned with our school through our Next Steps projects. I took part because I wanted to learn more about the tragedy that was the Holocaust and remember the victims in those dark times. During the project, we listened to the testimony of Janine Weber, BEM, a Holocaust survivor. She explained her story of how her life in Lwów, Poland, changed suddenly one day in June 1941, when Germany invaded the Soviet-occupied part of Poland. The Nazis forced Janine and her family into a squalid ghetto, and she barely escaped with the aid of her aunt, Ruja, and the sympathetic Polish men and women as a convent. This testimony provided for me a small look into what it was like to live in hiding and persecution. It is so important for us as the next generation to hear this testimony so we can continue to remember the Holocaust and safeguard the future of Holocaust education even when survivors are no longer able to share their testimony. I found the project to be immersive and it really humanized the Holocaust for me. When reading a Wikipedia page or a book about the Holocaust, there is a disconnect which makes us forget 
that the number of six million murdered Jews represents six million individual people with different hopes, dreams, aspirations, and experiences. The lessons from Auschwitz online project built that bridge between numbers and human lives and formed that connection. One moment in particular that I remember was reading out the poem, The Jewish Stettel, as part of the commemoration ceremony at the end of the project. This experience allowed me to consider all that I'd learned and brought me to a more in-depth and human understanding of the Holocaust. For my Next Steps project, me, Gia, and our fellow participants gave presentations to other peoples at our school to share what we had learned. In my presentation, I focused on the perpetrators of the Holocaust. My message was to, was to make sure people understood that the Holocaust was an entirely human event. From the victims, to the train drivers, the bureaucrats, the soldiers, and the Nazi higher-up, all who were involved were entirely human. There is nothing natural about genocide. It is too easy for us to distance ourselves from the perpetrators in particular. In, but in order to prevent this from happening again, we must be keenly aware of the capacity for human cruelty. Ambassadors like Lawrence and I are motivated to ensure that the generations after us will always remember the Holocaust. But to continue this legacy of remembrance, we must understand and reflect from the past. This is all the more crucial because future generations will not have the same access to first-hand testimonies as we do. And we are facing a growing presence of those that distort or even deny the Holocaust. Therefore, reaching out and encouraging our peers to acknowledge how, why, and in what capacity these atrocities happened means helping to prevent misinformation and manipulation of this history. It is also vital that learning about the Holocaust is not limited to our educational careers in a history classroom. Rather, the contemporary relevance of the Holocaust is clear throughout our lives. This ranges from learning the power of media and propaganda, to susceptibility to prejudice, the gradual decline of democracy, and encounters with racism and discrimination in each of our own lives. And most importantly, a connection with the past allows us to be consciously aware of violations of human rights in our current world. On the lessons from Auschwitz online project, we learned the significance of humanizing the victims of genocide and explored how this can be achieved. One example that really resonated with me was the Book of Names Memorial displayed on site Auschwitz-Birkenau. In these books, 4.2 million names of Jewish men, women, and children murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators are displayed. This is a stark reminder to us of the individuality of each one of these 4.2 million victims. However, the final pages of the books are blank, with space for the other 1.8 million names that have tragically been lost or forgotten. The theme chosen for this year's Holocaust Memorial Day, One Day, perfectly reflects the need to remember the victims not as a number, as a Nazi regime often limited them to, but as an array of diverse individuals with their own identities, families, personalities, and cultures. One memory that particularly stood out for me in Janine Weber's testimony was the day the Gestapo came. They didn't knock on her front door like they usually had, but instead they used brute force. The same day, her grandmother and her father were taken away. This one singular day signified a complete upheaval and the beginning of a period of tragedy for Janine and her family. Hearing from Janine reminded us that whilst the Holocaust as an event is in the past, the attitudes of blame, scapegoating, and othering that surround it are still problems present today. These feelings of hatred have increasingly resurfaced through the pockets of extremism present on social media platforms. Therefore now, more than ever, the legacy of the Holocaust must not be forgotten. We would like to thank the Holocaust Educational Trust for the opportunity to take part in the Lessons from Auschwitz online project, and the GLA for giving Lawrence and I 
the opportunity to share our experiences. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. You're, you're very good ambassadors for this, and um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm so pleased that you've recognized that we have to work in order to stop uh, this kind of event happening again. Now I would like to introduce Olivia Marks Waldman, OBE, the Chief Executive of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you, Sadiq. Thank you, Diane, and all your colleagues for organizing today's event and for hosting us here. Friends, you didn't think about yesterday, and tomorrow may not happen. It was only today that you had to cope with, and you got through it as best you could. These words were written by Ibi Nil, a survivor of the Holocaust. As we've heard, our theme this year, chosen by the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, is one day. The experiences of survivors are unimaginable to us today. And by reflecting through the prism of just one day, we can, we can learn so much about this history, a history to which there are still living witnesses. Holocaust Memorial Day is one day to remember the six million Jews murdered during the Holocaust, to commemorate members of other communities who suffered Nazi persecution, and to remember the millions murdered in genocides that have taken place since, in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, and Darfur. This event today is one of thousands taking place in workplaces, museums, prisons, churches, mosques, right across the UK, including several hundred in Greater London, each one supported by the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust. Holocaust Memorial Day will be marked in every London borough in poignant, creative, and inspiring ways. Each event, as we know today, helps us all learn more about the past empathize with people today who are facing persecution so that together with knowledge and empathy we can take steps towards a better future. And now it is my honor to introduce Eric Marangwa, MBE. Eric was a famous international football player in Rwanda when the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi began. He was saved when his attacker recognized him from his football team, but he lost more than 35 family members in the genocide. Eric has subsequently dedicated his life to supporting peace building. And we're so pleased and glad to have you with us today, Eric. Thank you. Good morning. I survived the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi because I was a footballer, because I was part of a team that protected me, and incredibly because the people who came to kill me were football fans. Sport, community, being together, working together, has the capacity to transcend hatred and division. Telling our stories of what happened to us helps us to heal. The work of Isham Foundation is to bring people together, tell our stories, and see peace for communities, countries, and the world. We actively work towards the one day where there will be no more genocide, no more violence. All people will be recognized as fully human. Ishami 
is the name of the name of organization is a Kinyarwanda word meaning branch, like a branch of tree, symbolizing resilience, recovery, and connection, even reconnection. Our work is to draw on the experience of genocide survivors in a way that help us all to connect to our common humanity. The dream of one day is made possible by hundreds of thousands of stories and choices. And I would like to tell you a little of my story and the way that the decision of a few people had an extraordinary impact. But first, a short lesson of history. For centuries, Rwanda existed as a centralized monarchy under a succession of Tutsi kings. The king was supreme, but the rest of the population, but Tutsi, Bahutu, and Batwa, lived in a symbiotic harmony, sharing one language, culture, and belief. In ancient Rwanda, Hutu, Tutsi, and Twa were considered to be social classes, not tribes. In 1895, the Germans claimed Rwanda as a colony and established indirect rule. After the First World War, the Belgians took control of Rwanda and neighboring Burundi. The Belgians developed ideas and theories that promoted racism and discrimination. By the late 1950s, there were growing tensions in the country between Hutu activists and Tutsi leaders. In 1959, there were, was the first outbreak of violence against Tutsis, with thousands killed. These attacks got to us over the following years. In 1962, Rwanda gained independence and it became a republic, abolishing the monarchy, but the new nation was built on hatred and of one another as a result of the visions that had been sown. This history matters. This history is how we got to 1994. By 1990s, ongoing violence and discrimination in the society and politics had created a diaspora of around one million refugees, mainly Tutsis. Tutsis living in exile were not allowed to return home for decades. They formed the Rwandan Patriotic Front, RPF, and entered the Rwanda by force in 1990. And as a result, there was a civil war. Government armed local groups, spread the messages of hate through radio stations and newspapers, encouraging violence against Tutsis still living in Rwanda. Despite a peace negotiation process and a temporary ceasefire in 1993, were, there were still many warning signs that the country was building up to genocide. I was born in the town of Rwamagana, in the east part of Rwanda, and my early life was one of humble comfort in Rwanda. I was the first born in a stable and professional family. My father was an accountant, my mother raised me, and my five siblings. The Rwanda that I experienced in my early life, it was stablish, with little evidence of the country's complex and the tragic recent past. As a young boy, you could see there were some issues, but I couldn't fully understand it. This changed when I started school. Teachers would ask two students to stand up to be identified and counted. It became clear that there were different types of people. In the late 70s, early 80s, my dad lost his job due to quota systems and discrimination based on ethnic lines. He was industrious. He opened small business and he thrived until we were harassed and targeted by local authorities again and have to move to the Rwandan capital, Kigali. I was fortunate 
I had been educated and was living well, but at this point, I began to lose my way. And it was here, during my formative years, that I developed a passion for football. I followed in my father's footsteps, becoming a fan of Rwanda's biggest football club, Rayon Sports. I simply invited myself to the club's training sessions, collecting balls kicked astray, and occasionally being asked to step in for the goalkeeper when he was late or not available. I was talent spotted by the team and became known as Toto and grew to become one of Rayon Sports' best loved players, a fact that will later save my life. I owe everything to football. Everything I am, everything that has happened to me is because of football. It has not saved me, it has not only saved me, but given me a platform to talk about the dangers of division. I saw the worst of humanity during the genocide, but I also saw a moment of heroism and love. 28 years ago, when Rwanda descended into total chaos, and to be honest, was abandoned by international community, sporting solidarity, any solidarity, became a matter of life and death. Between 1990 and 94, ethnic hatred was increasingly open, openly accepted, and as a result, I was enabled to travel with my football club to matches in certain parts of the country. There was a fear that I would be singled out or trapped because of my ethnic background or physical appearance. And then it happened, the catalyst. The plane carrying the president of Rwanda was shot down in the evening of 6 April 1994, and 100 dark days began. It was the last time I saw friends, colleagues, and family members, including my seven-year-old seven -year young brother, Iran Hunda Jean Paul. For the next few weeks, I experienced a Rwanda that I didn't believe to be possible. Roadblocks were set up by government forces, and militia were sent to kill and cause carnage. A collective mental disorder befell the country of a thousand hills, and the world would look on in a false horror. Soldiers stormed the house, demanding hidden weapons, but we told them we are just footballers. We have no weapons in our house. Refusing to believe my explanation that I was a player for Rayon Sports, they threatened to take my life unless I could prove it. The soldier holding the gun demanded an explanation. Don't lie to me, or I will shoot you right now. I am Rayon's biggest fan. I know every player on the team, so you better not tell me any lies, the soldier said. It's me, I said. If you know the club, then you will know it's me. I put out an old photo album because we had those then, and the soldier was able to recognize me through photos of my football club. A switch was flicked. All the menace and anger and hatred that has gnarled this man's face and had transformed him into, into a killer evaporated. Now he was smiling and he helped me to my feet. He sat me down in the nearby sofa. The soldier instructed his comrade to leave the room so he could talk about a beautiful game with one of his heroes. It was incredible. Even after all these years, when I think about it, it's hard to believe it. I had accepted death, and now this soldier was, wasn't a soldier. He was a fan. He was human. We spoke about famous victories and some big saves I had made. He left us unharmed and even provided advice on how to avoid trouble in the future. Without question, football saved my life. That moment, highlighted the power of sport and its ability to influence people. This evil person transformed 
in front of me because of his love for Rayon Sport Football Club. I didn't feel it at the time, but my desire to use football as a tool for unity and peace was planted then. Deciding I was no longer safe at home, I fled to my Hutu teammates' house. While many people throughout Rwanda were being killed by their friends and acquaintances, my Rayon Sport teammates remained, remained united throughout the genocide. What these teammates did was just an act of ordinary, but incredible people who demonstrated courage and the bravery that most people inside and outside Rwanda lacked at the time. Inspired by the actions, after the genocide, I realized that sport had tremendous power to unite where there were divisions, to heal where there were wounds, to see the human in humanity. Football saved my life. It transcended hatred and ethnic differences and ultimately gave me hope for the future. It is not an overstatement to say that the example of courage and humanity shown by my teammates is the inspiration behind everything I do. How do you genuinely recover from a tragedy like the one we experienced? Over a million innocent people, including more than 85 members of my extended family, perished in just 100 days. And many other millions were scattered all over the country and beyond. What do you do with a country where so many were perpetrators and even more were victims? What do you do when all lights go out and the darkness appears to have prevailed? In the aftermath of the genocide, Rwanda made the choice to build reconciliation, peace, and unity. Instead of revenge, we have given each other forgiveness. Instead of continuing hatred, we have learned to love our neighbor as ourselves. Instead of war, we have an authentic peace that surpasses all logic or understanding. Instead of continuous destruction, there is marked restoration. Today, I am inspired by the power of change that has taken place in my country. Rwanda is beautiful. The roaring hills that were once stained with blood are now dotted with crops and livestock. But we know it is not done yet. Peace and the recognition of our common humanity is an ongoing and active choice in Rwanda, in the UK, and everywhere. This is not just a powerful story on an important day. This is an ongoing pursuit of a better world, standing against hatred that fuels this kind of atrocities has to start with small actions, encouraging good choices and good policies, equipping young people with skills and values to allow them to become engaged and responsible citizens. The Sham Foundation operates here in the UK and in Rwanda, where we use the power of sport and storytelling to build equality, tolerance, and lasting peace. We work with survivors, young people, school, communities, and partner organizations to raise awareness of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda and other modern genocides. Our sporting and cultural activities empower participants by fostering respect, team spirit, critical thinking, and resilience, and it has impact. Perspectives shift and lives are changed when people hear these stories. Lessons are learned about the mistakes of the past, the suffering endured by genocide survivors from the Holocaust, Rwanda, Bosnia, Darfur, and elsewhere. And as a result, we are one step closer to the one day, a world more aware and united in defiance of recognizable, preventable hatred behind genocide. We are uniquely placed to do this work, but we need your help. We need help from leaders, institutions, and organizations so that we can reach a broader audience and bring about lasting change, the kind of change that's needed in our country and our world. 
Alongside the Holocaust, we need more teaching for recent genocide in classrooms. It must be included in the current public debate around the importance of a more comprehensive history syllabus. Rwanda, East Africa, in 1994, may all seem a long way away, a long time past, but it was in our lifetime, in many of our living memories. I am leaving evidence that seemingly small choices have an impact. As we aspire to a one day in the future, let us not forget the courageous choices that have a big impact in challenging identity-based prejudice, right here, right now. Help us to make 1994 genocide against the Tutsi and other modern genocide as part of everyday education and conversation in schools universities, communities, so that we can learn from these terrible atrocities and create a better future so that never again and one day aren't just catchphrases or a dream, but a reality. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Eric and uh, Olivia. I would like now... <coughs> I'd like to welcome back Gia and Lawrence to read the statement of commitment for Holocaust Memorial Day. We recognize that the Holocaust shook the foundations of modern civilization. Its unprecedented character and horror will always hold universal meaning. We believe that the Holocaust must have permanent place in our nation's collective memory. We honor the survivors still with us and reaffirm our shared goals of mutual understanding and justice. We must make sure that future generations understand the causes of the Holocaust and reflect upon its consequences. We vow to remember the victims of Nazi persecution and of all genocide. We value the sacrifice of, of those who risk their lives to protect or rescue victims as a touchstone of the human capacity for good in the face of evil. We recognize that humanity is still scarred by the belief that race, religion, disability or sexuality means makes some people's lives worth less than others. Genocide, anti-Semitism, racism, xenophobia and discrimination still continue. We have a shared responsibility to fight these evils. We pledge to strengthen our efforts to promote education and research about the Holocaust and other genocides. We will do our utmost to make sure that the lessons of such events are fully learned. We will continue to encourage Holocaust rem remembrance by holding an annual UK Holocaust Memorial Day. We condemn the evils of prejudice, discrimination and racism we value a free, tolerant, and democratic society. Thank you. I would now like to invite Rabbi Epstein and Rebetzin Epstein uh, to give their reflections, recite the memorial, memorial prayer, and light the memorial candle. Um, and there will be a minute's silence. Vayikra, it's what we call Leviticus in Hebrew. Leviticus is a word that means of the Levites, and it is the third book of the Bible, and we speak a lot about what happens in the tabernacle in the desert and later in the temple in Jerusalem. Yet the word vayikra means he called, as in God called Moses, and by extension called us. This is an anthem to vocation. A vocation is a task set by God, Religious history is all about vocation. A leader, a prophet, a teacher, 
an individual, called by God to perform a task for the betterment of his creation. Each of us is different, therefore, we each have unique talents and skills to bring to this world. The fact that you and I are here in this place, on this day, on this one day, is not accidental. We have a task to perform, and that is our calling. My calling is to teach. I'm privileged and humbled to be an educator for J Roots and the Holocaust Educational Trust's Lesson from Auschwitz program. I have been a part, along with so many other educators, of connecting the events of the past to lessons for our future. We, the educators, are a bridge. We bridge the gap between the survivors and the students. Our survivors are our last generation, a generation and a remnant of a world that no longer exists. It only exists in the memories and memoirs of a select few. Our students are also a last generation, the last generation that will hear firsthand testimonies from those survivors. Our job as a society, and especially as educators, is to bridge that chasm, to ensure that the values learned from our survivors are carried by our students into the future. Viktor Frankl, a psychotherapist who survived Auschwitz, believed in the calling of the individual, even in the nightmare of the camps. He advised the people he spoke to as he walked through the camp, ask not, what, light, what you want from life. Rather, what does life want from you? Frankel goes on to quote from one of his students. But in the darkness, I acquired a sense of my own unique mission. I knew then, as I know now, that I had been preserved for some reason, however small. It is something that only I can do. In that solitary pit where man had abandoned me, he was there. When I did not know his name, he was there. God was there. Not all of us feel called to greatness. That is not true. We are all worthwhile, valuable, and beloved by God. Every day, every single day, we have a task. To paraphrase the late chief rabbi, <clears throat> Lord Jonathan Sachs, we have work to do, we have kindness to show, we have gifts to give, we have love to share, we have loneliness to ease, we have pain to heal, we have broken lives to help mend, and we have students to teach. Hearing our calling, as the survivors heard their calling, gives our lives meaning, it is our calling to carry this one day forward into the future. Thank you, Lana. <clears throat> Dear friends, as those privileged to be alive at this moment in history, we have a responsibility, as has been mentioned by all of our speakers here today, to remember. Our task in this world as proud British citizens as people of conscience, as Jews, is to be the eternal memory of those who do not have a voice anymore, and a guarantee to be a bridge to those who will come after us in the future. This is a memorial prayer that is recited in synagogues and memorial services around the Jewish world in various forms to give a voice to the voiceless. May their memories be an eternal blessing. El male rachamim shochen v'amromim hametzei menucha nuchona al kanfei ashkina v'mahalot kedoshim muteorim. Kazor akia meirim umazirim lenishmot shisha milyone achenu vene Israel 
אנשים, נשים, ילדים וילדות שנהרגו, שנשחטו, שנשרפו, שנחנקו, שנטבעו ושנקברו חיים בידי הנאצים ועוזריהם יימח שמם. באושוויץ, מיידנק, טרבלינקה, מאוטהאוזן ובשאר מחנות ההשמדה ומסרו את נפשם על קדושת השם. בעבור שאנו מתפללים לעילוי נשמותיהם, לכן בעל הרקמים יסתירם בשאת כנפיו לעולמים, ויצרו מצרו החיים את נשמותיהם בגן עדן. מנוחתם, אדוני הוא נחלתם, וינוחו בשלום על משקפם, ונאמר אמן. Please stand for a minute's silence. Thank you. Please do be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of our ceremony. I'm sure you will agree with me that the words and testimonies we have heard today will resonate with us for a very long time. I, for one, am moved beyond words from what we've heard of those who firsthand have experienced um, discrimination based upon who you are rather than the quality of your spirit. On behalf of us all at City Hall, I would like to give our thanks to everyone who shared so openly your experiences, to Eric and to Steve. Um, I'd like to th our, thank our lessons from Auschwitz ambassadors, um, on whose shoulders the retelling of these histories lies very he heavily. And I'm so pleased that younger generations are learning this message. It is, I sometimes think the word hope is overplayed. H hope is not enough. We have to work hard to remember the lessons of the past. We are honored to hear from Rabbi and Rebetzin Epstein, thank you for your reflections and your prayers. And last but no, mini, uh, no means least, to thank our event partners, uh, Olivia Marks Waldman from the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust and Karen Pollock from the Holocaust Educational Trust, without whose kind and tireless cooperation, this event could not have happened, so thank you. Uh, finally, our thanks to the Jewish Music Institute for their contri contributions to our event today, and of course our talented musician, uh, Emmanuel Bach on violin, who we will hear more from shortly. Thank you for watching the ceremony online, and Shalom Alechaim. Peace be with you, and let's work 
towards that one day. Thank you.